it's clear that many of us in Britain are in love with the past. Whether it's swordcraft or spitfires, mead or musketry, we relish harking back. But it's not so much history we're in love with as something rather less true, but just as powerful, the olden days. Mention the olden days to any child and they'll know exactly what you mean. It's a precise historical period, dating back from when their parents were children to about 10,000 years BC. It's the vast realm of everything that's supposedly gone before. Some of it is in black and white, some of it's in glorious technicolour, and a lot of it is slightly out of focus. But even when we grow up as adults in this country, many of us retain that deep fascination for a heightened, idealised, imagined past, including me. In this series, I'll be enjoying the very best of the olden days. As seen in our art, our literature and our occasionally delusional collective consciousness. I'll be looking at two of our oldest, greatest heroes. Our need for colourful, time-honoured tradition. And our deep love for the countryside of yesterday. But I do have a warning for you. The olden days has the best characters and the best stories, though not necessarily the best facts. It's the place for myths and legends, for that grey area between truth and fiction. It's often what we want to believe happened rather than what really happened, and it's quite often what the person writing the history is very keen for us to believe. But the extraordinary thing about the olden days is that they've always been alive and active, creative and influential, and very much in the here and now. It's odd but true that we're pretty familiar with our deepest past. And though they're known as the Dark Ages, it's amazing how vividly we still connect to the stories of Celts, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings, to that vast and vague epoch between the Romans leaving in 410 AD and the Normans arriving in 1066. The thing about going back to the mists of time is that they're pretty misty. Information about the Dark Ages is in short supply, so we can fill in the gaps with our imagination, furnishing these very olden days with a cast of wizards, dragons and charismatic warrior kings. It's to two characters in particular that we have returned again and again. The first, King Arthur, probably never existed. The second, Alfred the Great, was certainly real, but was reinvented to suit the needs of every age. These two very different Dark Age kings are pillars of our national story, our foundation myth. Out of their heroic deeds, and the round tables and the burnt cakes, emerges the idea of Britain itself. Everyone knows Arthur, or so they think. His story has swirled around for at least a thousand years. But where did the tales of Arthur actually start? The very earliest references are a few obscure fragments 
depicting him as a wild Celtic warlord from Wales in perhaps the early 6th century. But the figure we know, a king conceived here in Tintagel in Cornwall, a king with a band of brave knights and a magical ally called Merlin, was created in the traumatic aftermath of the Norman conquest. And that's because it's when things change the most that the past becomes most inspiring. Arthur put on a leather jerkin worthy of so great a king. On his head he placed a golden crest carved in the shape of a dragon. He girded on his peerless sword called Caliburn, which was forged in the Isle of Avalon. A spear called Ron graced his right hand, long, broad and thirsty for slaughter. The man who penned Arthur's story was a monk, Geoffrey of Monmouth, in the year 1136. His book was called History of the Kings of Britain, yet Geoffrey didn't claim to have written it. Cleverly, he claimed to have translated it from a very old book in the British tongue, which he'd been given. No one has ever found this very old book, probably because it doesn't exist. But Geoffrey was very keen to claim it as a source, to make his history seem more ancient, more venerable, more true. He wanted to create the authentic account of a glorious but vanished age. Geoffrey recounted that it was Brutus of Troy, no less, who'd first led the perilous voyage to distant Albion to defeat its giants and rename it Britain after himself. You'll find Julius Caesar in Geoffrey's history, not to mention King Lear and even old King Cole. But the character that really grabbed the hearts and minds of the newly arrived Normans was Celtic King Arthur. The Normans wanted to feel that they belonged in Britain, that they were part of the story. So they weren't interested in Anglo-Saxon heroes. These were the people they just conquered, the people who they could see digging ditches and feeding swine outside their castle walls. But when Geoffrey of Monmouth came up with an obscure Celtic hero from hundreds of years before, who'd actually taken on the Saxon invaders at the time, then this was ideal for the new rulers. And it proved surprisingly popular amongst their Anglo-Saxon subjects, because for them, the story was all about a local hero resisting cruel, tyrannous foreign invaders. So Arthur became a shared British hero from a safely distanced but romanticised past, the mystical, magical olden days. Even at the time, this was all too much for rival historians. William of Newburgh's History of English Affairs was far more factual, but far less popular. He said of Geoffrey, It's quite clear that everything this man wrote was made up. Only a person ignorant of ancient history would have any doubt about how shamelessly and impudently he lies in almost everything. It's the historian's classic complaint. You may have the truth on your side, but if your story's dull, no one will want to read it. Thanks to Geoffrey of Monmouth's lead, Arthur flourished. European poets in the 12th century turned him into the leading man of their chivalric romances. But there was an English king whose claims to hero status far outweighed Arthur's, and he was real. This was the Christian monarch who, in 878 AD, defeated the great heathen army of the Vikings, who united Anglo-Saxon kingdoms into what would become England itself. Hello, James. Ian, how nice to see you. Welcome nice to St to Mary's. Be... Thank you. Where's the jewel? Where's the jewel? We put the jewel out for you in the Lady Chapel. In the 17th century, an artefact was found in a field here in Somerset, which shed some light on this Dark Age king. A replica of this priceless treasure is kept at St Mary's. 
On the front, seen through rock crystal, is an enigmatic, enamelled figure. It appears to be a middle-aged man with fair hair, without a beard, slightly boss-eyed, wearing green, and his image set in this fantastic, ornate, jewelled item, which is called an astle, which is a pointer. There was a stick like this here, but it's rotted away, and it's used for pointing out passages in scripture, the important bits you point like this. The clue to who made this astle comes with its inscription in filigreed gold. It says Alfred, which is Alfred, Alfred the Great, Alfred Mech Hecht Yvurchan. Alfred had me made, which he did. He had these made um, and gave them out to various churches in order to spread the gospel. The figure in the jewel might be Christ. He might be a symbol of learning or wisdom. Tantalisingly, some have suggested he might even be Alfred himself. Whoever he is, it's one of the very few objects we have that provide a direct, tangible link to Dark Age Alfred. The man who rallied the English, the man who defeated the Vikings, the man who subsequent Victorian historians would say was the most perfect character in history. The trouble is, it doesn't matter how perfect you are if everyone forgets you. He's become rather obscure as a figure, hasn't he? I mean, there was a period where everybody knew who King Alfred was. Do you think that's true anymore? No, I think you're probably right. But um, the Alfred jewel, particularly here, mm. is, is held in, in great respect. Uh, but as a figure himself, yeah, he does seem to get lost in the midst of time. I couldn't help noticing this. Um, that the You've niche spotted it, yes. Where Alfred used to be, there's now a plaque that says Diana, Princess of Wales. Mm. And that, another, that shows how fickle piece, history another, is. Another piece of history. Yeah. So in a sense, the public moves on, doesn't yes. it? Yes, it Finds does. other heroes. This is the heart of Wessex, the kingdom that Alfred saved. In fact, you could argue he saved the whole of England. Not only did Alfred repel the Vikings, he reorganised the army, drafted a new legal code, and put learning at the heart of his kingdom. Not perhaps as exciting as pulling a sword from a stone, but rather more useful. Here was a real monarch with a genuine political, legal and cultural legacy. But people preferred fairy tale Arthur to workaday Alfred. There's gratitude for you. That's the fabulous quality of the olden days. They really are a great cabinet of curiosities. Just about everything and anything can be drawn out to suit the current times. Or tucked away again. So while Anglo-Saxon Alfred was consigned to obscurity, Celtic Arthur underwent another upgrade. Already transformed from obscure Welsh warlord, into Geoffrey's superhero king, and then Europe's leading man, he was about to change again, becoming not just heroic, but holy. Arthur was now on a mission from God, questing for nothing less than the Holy Grail, the very cup Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. And the transformation happened at one of the most magical sites in England. Welcome to Glastonbury Abbey. My name is Leia Frick, and I am one of the abbot's tithesmen. I'd like to start off my tours by, first of all, talking about the legend saying that Joseph of Arimathea came to Glastonbury Abbey. Joseph of Arimathea is meant to have been Jesus's great uncle. Now, Joseph brought with him a very special treasure. Many people say that Joseph would have brought the Holy Grail with him and that when he gets here, he buries this cup in the ground to prevent anyone from getting their hands on it, for using it for any evil means or anything like that. Now, sceptical historians might consider it a touch implausible that Christendom's holiest relic should fetch up in Somerset, particularly since no one had ever found it again. 
And yet it was extremely well known that in the olden days, Arthur and his knights had actually felt its holy presence right here. Which made Arthur the obvious saviour for the monks of Glastonbury Abbey when in 1184 their monastery was ravaged by fire. It was a half timber, half stone building with a thatched roof, so it's meant to burn very quickly indeed, so there's not much left. And they have just built this beautiful chapel over here. So they're obviously a bit strapped for cash, and they think finding a wonderful relic is going to reinvigorate the trade. They'll get more rich benefactors, more people want to come and visit their monastery. By an extraordinary coincidence, in their hour of darkest need, one of the monks had a vision. It told him that King Arthur himself was buried nearby. They hastily began digging, sensibly enough, in the cemetery. And would you believe it, they found some bones. The bones of the great King of Camelot and his beloved wife. Gerald of Wales was a medieval chronicler who'd been rather sniffy about Arthur until he peered inside the grave with his own eyes and he was miraculously converted. This is what he wrote he saw. A coffin made from a hollowed out oak with two bodies in it, deep in the earth at Glastonbury. And on top of the grave, there was a lead cross with an inscription on it. And Gerald not only read the inscription, he felt the letters with his fingers. And this is what it said. Here lies buried the renowned King Arthur with Guinevere, his second wife, in the Isle of Avalon. Proof. Did the monks consciously think, we've got the grail, there's some stories connected with the grail with Arthur, let's find Arthur. It may have been, yes, we desperately need money, the best way to do it is to find a very famous individual. Who has everyone heard of in England at the time? Who's popular kind of in the culture at the time? Arthur. One thing's for sure, this handy discovery of a legendary hero at just the right time certainly paid dividends. The Abbey was rebuilt as cash flooded in from all the new visitors flocking to Glastonbury. And the town has been trading on its reputation as a mystic wonderland ever since. I'd like to go back now to the real olden days, way back to the late 1970s, a golden age when I was an English student. Yes, there were Arthurian romances to read, but at university I learnt that in the history of English language, Arthur plays second fiddle to Alfred. This is my sweet Anglo-Saxon reader, a selection of texts written in the original Anglo-Saxon that we had to study as part of the course at Oxford. And one of the pieces was Pope Gregory's Pastoral Care, and it's hugely influential in England largely because we think it was the first book ever translated from Latin into English. And the person who translated it was Alfred Cunninga, King Alfred. Alfred believed in education, and as so few people understood Latin, he translated the most important works into Anglo-Saxon English. He wrote, and if you'll forgive the accent, for thou may thunk better, if ye are swa thunk, that we eak summa bech, tha the need be they are foster than ialum monum to we are told. He says he wants translated some books that are most needful for men to know, so they can read them in their own language. And that is a pretty progressive thought from the so-called Dark Ages. So, for early scholars, Alfred was always a hero, even though the rest of the medieval world had largely forgotten him. Perhaps that's why, when a crisis hit the newly formed University College at Oxford, it wasn't the spirit of Arthur the fellow summoned, it was Alfred. 
So what exactly are we looking at? We're looking at a piece of parchment written in the 1380s, and it records a great big legal dispute involving University College. We had acquired some land in the 1360s, and the descendants of the original vendor claimed that there was an error in the small print. And this was a big error, because if we lost the land, we'd lose two-fifths of our income. With the dispute going against them, the fellows of University College had a brainwave. They wrote this craftily penned petition to the king, Richard II, asking him to intervene in the legal dispute. So, to the most excellent, redoubtable and reverend Lord our King and his most wise counsel, your pauper petitioners, the master and scholars of your college, first founded by your noble ancestor, King Alfred, what you've got to imagine is there's Richard II probably getting a whole lot of petitioners around him. And some of your majesty, look, this is a place that was founded by King Alfred, your ancestor, sire. Ah. Richard, who's a teenager, at this point says, oh, this sounds fun, I would have a look. Why did using Alfred's name appeal to Richard? Well, Richard was something of a genealogy geek among English monarchs. He, I think it's part of his wanting to project himself as very monarchic, very regal, very much the monarch. And as part of that is kind of, look at all my great line of ancestors. Alfred is suitable, he's appropriate as a monarch and as a founder, but unfortunately, he didn't found the college, did he? He didn't at all. We were really founded by a guy called William of Durham, who was a theologian at Paris, a very splendid man, but he's not exactly famous, is he? So, despite the fact that this petition is beautifully mm. presented, it's nicely written by a scribe, mm. they've just made it up, haven't they? Yes. All of it? Yes. But it worked. It worked? Yes. We keep the property, and it's all sorted. So actually, King Alfred was a very good chum to us. Is there no sense of irony amongst the scholars about the fact that as a centre of academic excellence, their founding myth is, is nonsense? I had this slight feeling about the people that created this. They thought, surely we must be this ancient. Surely we must be founded by King Alfred. And you get this again and again if you look at kind of the kind of bogus histories that you see for other institutions like Cambridge or indeed Parliament. It's kind of they wish it so, that they want and to go back. therefore it is. They go back to the olden days, even older olden days, if they possibly can. And Alfred is about as olden as the university needed. He was. He, he'll do nicely, yes. And the rest, as they say, is history even when it isn't. Alfred was co-opted as founder of the entire university. I may have mentioned at the beginning that the stories of history can prove powerful, even when they have little connection with the truth. And this turns out to be especially the case when one is dealing with Oxford-educated lawyers. So, in the later Middle Ages, Alfred continued to have fans amongst the bookish elite. But it was dashing Arthur who remained the crowd pleaser. At the end of the 15th century, handwritten manuscripts gave way to print in an information revolution. And one of the very first bestsellers to spring from the new printing presses was a sensational new telling of the Arthur story. Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur was a very different Arthur, for different, darker times. The country had just emerged from bloody civil war, the War of the Roses. Mallory wrote his epic romance while in jail. No wonder his Arthur is characterised less by Christian daring do than by betrayal, sexual intrigue and death. In Mallory's version, the treacherous Sir Mordred is Arthur's own illegitimate son, and he gets his revenge on his father by attempting to marry Arthur's queen, Guinevere, and stealing his kingdom from him. Everybody you love ends up dead, and Mallory himself had seen his country torn in two by the dynastic feuding between the houses of York and Lancaster, and all his anguish and all the tragedy of that time is channeled into this Le Mort d'Arteur, one of the most influential works in English literature.
when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death wound, he smote Arthur with his sword. The sword pierced the helmet, and therewithal Sir Mordred fell stark dead, and the noble Arthur fell in a swoon to the earth. Mallory's story was to become the basis for every subsequent Arthurian tale. From childhood classics to television adaptations and big budget movies. Back in the 16th century, Arthur's popularity made him extremely useful to a new young king. In 1509, when Henry VIII came to the throne, the Welsh Tudors were seen by many as recent upstarts. So they claimed Arthurian descent to bolster their legitimacy. Some sort of relic linking Henry to King Arthur would be absolutely ideal. Unfortunately, the Grail was buried somewhere in Glastonbury. So what else might there be? Well, how about this? This extraordinary one and a quarter ton oak phenomenon had long been one of Winchester's greatest attractions. King Arthur's Round Table, where King Arthur had presided over the ideal court at Camelot, and the knights had sat there, Sir Lancelot, Sir Galahad, Sir Gawain, Sir Bors, Sir Percival, the evil Sir Mordred. In 1522, Henry threw an extravagant Arthurian-themed party, inviting the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, to this very hall. Henry VIII was determined to impress his royal friend. So he gave the table a complete makeover. He had it painted and he put his own emblem, the Tudor Rose, smack in the middle. He also included a portrait of Arthur, who looks remarkably like Henry VIII. It wasn't subtle, but Henry didn't do subtlety. His message was clear. He was the heir to Arthur. Though the Arthurian table was pure fantasy, the parallels between Henry's court and Camelot were not. Like Arthur, Henry's love life was far from simple. His divorce from Catherine of Aragon led to the break with the Roman Catholic Church, which in turn led to the English Reformation, which in turn led to the re-emergence of Alfred. The 16th century was a time of national trauma, as Catholics and Protestants died and killed for their beliefs. Iconoclastic Protestants would have melted down the Holy Grail, not revered it. Arthur was out. Alfred was in. He became a figurehead for the Protestants, cunningly reinvented to legitimise their religious revolution. This would be the most audacious piece of historical manipulation yet. Protestants wanted to have a more direct line to God, to be able to read scripture in their own language. This was revolutionary stuff. And if there's one thing we British don't much like, it's revolution. An ancient king who shared their values would make England's new religious establishment seem far less radical. And Alfred, we remember from our Anglo-Saxon reader, had translated religious works into English. Alfred took what was a religion which expresses itself mostly in the Latin and he turns it into something available in English for English priests, for English educated laity, for English courtiers. Most people would have imagined that the first English versions of anything in the Bible were much, much later. I think they would be surprised to find out that it was Alfred who did it. Yes, he respected the English language in ways that were never the case at the time in other parts of Europe with their own native tongues and definitely believe that English people deserve to have their religion brought to them in the language that 
they lived in. And that resonated very, very strongly, of course, with the Protestant mission. The man who realised Alfred might be effectively spun to give the new Protestant nation the historical pedigree it lacked was Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury under Elizabeth I. Parker dug out an ancient biography of the Anglo-Saxon monarch, which had been written by one of Alfred's own courtiers, a bishop called Asa. Asa did his royal master proud. He presents Alfred as the supremely accomplished monarch. He defeats the Vikings. He rebuilds London. He reorganises the tax system. And he still has time to learn Latin in the evenings. This is less biography than hagiography. The problem for Alfred is that he's too perfect. He's in danger of being dull. We crave a moment of fallibility, a hint of weakness, a human touch. One good story would do it. And that is where Archbishop Parker comes in again. The king was sitting by the hearth preparing his bows and arrows and other weapons of war. When the wretched woman saw the cakes burning, she ran in, abusing the unconquered king, saying, Ah, you man! When you saw the cakes burning, why were you too lazy to turn them? For you're glad enough to eat them all hot. Now that unlucky woman little thought that he was King Alfred. The burnt cake story hadn't been in Asa originally, but Parker slipped it in, having come across it in another, later, even more obscure manuscript. Alfred's culinary cock-up soon became one of the most popular stories of the age. And Alfred, one of our most popular kings. The reinvention was more successful than Parker could ever have foreseen. This new, old king, perfect for the Protestant age, would, from the 17th century on, be known by all Britons as Alfred the Great. All stories need a hero, and the national story is no exception. When I was a child, British history was a seamless narrative of British heroes in stirring tales. And I didn't bother much then about the accuracy of the sources or whether they existed at all. I just responded to the characters. And I wasn't entirely wrong, because as I've got older, I've realised that the important thing about heroes is not so much who they are, but who we need them to be. We talk about looking up to heroes, but we're actually projecting onto them our current obsessions and passions. It's this malleable quality.